God's word for us this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Listen for the word of the Lord. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The Word of God for the people of God. As you're now aware, I like to preach my way whenever possible through a whole book of the Bible. I like that it lets us follow the thoughts of the original author. It means we don't have to cover everything all at once. It lets the scripture breathe enough to say what we need to hear, and it gives us a sense that we're going somewhere from week to week. We're winding this letter down, and we'll finish it next week, but I'm reminded of something I've noticed over the years. In order to tell you about it, I want to tell you about the time in my previous appointments when I preached through every passage in the book of Romans. Now, I waited until I'd been there for three years because Romans is something of a bear to work through, and I wanted to make sure we really knew each other before I tried to tackle it. And I was so excited. Paul's letter to the Romans is perhaps the most influential book in all of Western history. You could say, without too much exaggeration, that the history of how the church has read the Bible as a whole is really just an extension of how the church has read that one letter. Passage after passage is famous. There are endless commentaries written on it, and so I just knew that the sermons would be incredibly easy to prepare. Boy, oh boy, was I wrong. All the parts I thought would be easy were like pulling teeth. It was like one of those things where it's easy to make it seem like you have all the answers until you're brought face to face with the real answer. If you preach your way through the letter of Romans, you really have to come to terms with just how Just reading. The most difficult passages to preach on are the ones that everybody knows. As a preacher, you always want to say something, anything that not everyone in the congregation has already thought through and understood. Not that we need to seem super clever, it's just that it seemed like a bit of a waste to preach a sermon that, in so many words, is really saying nothing more than, hey, you all know this passage, right? It means just what you always knew. And even if that's mostly the case, preachers often want to give you something to chew on after you leave the service. Well, with all that said, this is a particularly famous passage in Philippians, which means it's not always easy to prepare a sermon on it. The standard approach for this passage would be to reflect at length about the nature of joy, about what it means to rejoice, and what Paul could mean by exhorting people to rejoice. I'm not so sure this is the most helpful. I can even draw attention to the kind of character Paul encourages the people to have. But again, I think that everyone would agree that we are to rejoice, to be gentle, to avoid anxiety, to seek peace, and to focus our attention on things that are good. If I just said all of that, I think most people would nod their heads and then go on with their day. Maybe someone would even grumble to themselves. They could have told themselves that. This is how the passage cuts close to home for me. Think to yourself about how Christians are seen in our larger society. I don't mean how to think about how the Christians you know well and have an ongoing relationship with. I don't mean to think about all the acts of mercy and love that you personally have received over the years. Think only about what someone on the outside of the church sees of Christians. This is an extremely important exercise because our culture has changed a lot in the past few decades. Maybe it hasn't been quite as extreme in this particular part of the world, but I'm sure you have all seen hints of it, either in your own neighborhood or in other places you've been or heard about. There was a time within the memories of many people in this room where most people went to church most weekends. Today, at least in church leadership circles, you hear a lot about what they call the nuns and the duns. 
It's a reference to people who either have no church experience of any kind or they used to have it and have since turned their backs on it. Here are the statistics. In 2007, about 16% of Americans claimed no religious affiliation. In 2015, it was 23%. In 1980, 8% of people under the age of 30 had no religious affiliation. Just a few number, a few years ago, that number was up to 32%. That means that nationwide, about one in every three children and young adults have no experience in the church at all. Now, that's not to say they've had a noticeably bad experience. In fact, as those who have had bad experiences in the church stop raising their kids in the church, most of these people will have had no experience at all. If somebody doesn't know anything from their own experience about a group of people, where do they get their ideas about them? Well, more and more, people will get their ideas about them, about people they don't know, from the news or, increasingly, the internet. And that means that a third of children and young adults don't know anything reliable about Christians and Christianity other than what they have seen on the news or what they have read on the internet. And I don't know about you, but that sends a chill down my spine. You see, I don't know if you've been on the internet recently, but it can be an ugly place. It is not a place where our best character usually comes out, where we act on our best impulses. I've seen people who are sweet and kind people when face-to-face -face type things to a stranger that would make you question their common decency. I imagine you have too. There are days when it's a struggle for me to remember to treat people as if their in-person character is more true to who they are than what they're like on Facebook or Twitter. And what all this means is that people don't always get a very nice picture of what Christians are like. People often assume that we believe things or do things that we don't believe and do. It's easy to find people online who will make it seem like the whole point of going to church is to criticize anyone who's different and to feel better about picking on people. The baseline assumption of a growing number of people is that Christians are, by definition, hypocrites. Now, I don't like that description and I suspect that you don't like it much either. But the thing is, I have never yet convinced anyone that they're wrong just by saying, you're wrong. People are often prepared to believe what feels right more than what actually is right, especially if finding out what actually is right takes some work to sort out what's real from what's an exaggeration. It's because of this whole mess of context that I think we need to pay careful attention to what Paul has to say and to listen to what comes after the famous call to rejoice. Paul tells the Philippians to let their gentle spirit be known to everyone because the Lord is near. Even when people are wrong, even when people are mean-spirited, even when people twist your words, even when they seem out to get you, we are called to be people of a gentle spirit. Now, that's not to say we become pushovers or anything like that, but we are called to use no more sternness, no more harshness than is absolutely required by the situation. It isn't just that we need to cultivate a reputation for being gentle even in the middle of difficult situations. We have to overcome a public perception that we are overly angry or mean to others. Paul continues, telling us that we are not to be anxious about anything. I mentioned before that the internet, where more and more people spend more and more of their time, is not always a very nice place. It's also not a place to go if you are plagued by anxiety. I admit that I spend more time on social media than I probably should, and I justify it to myself that I want to keep up to date with people and what they're saying. But I know that when I have cut that out of my life for a season, I've felt better. There are times when I have deliberately stepped back from social media because I discovered I was getting more stressed out because of it. I had a professor who had a kind of motto that he would share every so often, and I don't know if he invented it, but I always associate it with him. He would say, anybody who is nice to you, but is rude to the waiter, is not a nice person. I think that while this may cause some discomfort, it has a lot to say. The idea is that how we treat our friends, the people who like us and the people we already like, doesn't say much about us because literally everyone treats their friends well. The real question is how we treat people whom we may never see again, to whom we owe basically nothing, and who have no power over us. The reason why this is a big deal is because if we're nice to people who are nice to us, or if we're nice to the people who can reward us for being nice, then we might only be doing nice things because we know that it pays. If a person is nice to the person who can do nothing for them, who is in a position of service like a waiter, it likely isn't because they hope to get something out of it. It's likely because they are nice. 
The fact of the matter is, this is really just a version in terms that might strike us in a new way of what Jesus already said. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you, only, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I bring up all this in the context of the internet and how it shapes people's perceptions of Christians because I think that another rewording of those words might be someone who's nice to you but is rude to people online, on Facebook, on Twitter, is not a nice person. And there might be some squirming because I think we all know someone who is nice to us but is rude to people on the internet. I have friends from seminary who simply savage other friends from seminary who dare to share an opinion with which they disagree. I've seen people who are kind to me in person write the most hateful things about other people, assuming the worst about people, joking about other people being physically harmed, arrested, or even killed. In the meantime, these kinds of posts are alternated with posts about how they're loved by God, about how they're saved by grace, and other things of that nature. And I sometimes ask myself, what would someone think about Christians and Christianity if the only information they got was what Christians post on Facebook and Twitter? What if we listen to Paul? And I mean really listen to him. What if we listened to him in a way that not only changed how we describe ourselves, but actually became the rule for how we interacted with one another, not just in person, but online? What if we insisted on following Paul's advice even when someone's wrong on the internet? Even if we think the issue is really important? Paul tells the Philippians, and through them to us, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. What if every person who publicly acknowledges their faith committed to doing this? What if we all committed ourselves to not letting any unkind word pass from our lips or through our fingers? What if we committed to doing more to convince people of the truth by showing how much life the truth brings rather than simply shaming them for the ways they disagree with us? We need to remember that Paul is giving this advice while he's in prison, waiting to be executed. If we could cleanse the words and actions of Christians, both in person and online, just think about how we could change the way the world understands who Jesus is. Now, there may be few, a few people in this room who spend little to no time online, and maybe they don't have much firsthand knowledge of what I've been talking about, but I bet the overwhelming majority of people know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, I bet most of us, including myself, know that there has been at least a time or two when we have not always lived up to Paul's call for our lives. Let us commit together to do better, to be better, because we've been called to be better to follow our Lord Jesus Christ in every way. And while Jesus was sometimes stern with people, he was never unkind. And he certainly did not feel he had to attend to every argument he was invited to. While he often brought a word of correction, he did not try to make sure everyone he met was always right about everything. And that means that we must do the same. Let us find ways to encourage one another and show the world what it means to follow Christ. Let's pray.